I'm notoriously terrible with time, but I'm going to speak very quickly, and I'll just stop when time is up. Um, I uh, thank you, Shu. I Shu and I have known each other for a long time. She was one of my favorite students of all time, and now she's animating this incredibly important endeavor here in Somerville. Um, I, I guess I do that, yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> I, th there was a competition that uh, the Urban Design Department in Somerville initiated some years ago, I think maybe eight years ago. Uh, I'm not good with that kind of time either, but quite a while ago, we entered the competition and immediately found that, w that the way it was framed didn't make sense, at least to us, and so we kind of veered away from the parameters they had set. Uh, didn't make sense to enter the competition, but the subject matter was so interesting, we pursued it for quite a long time in the office and developed a kind of strategy for Somerville. Tried to get people interested in it. We're not good at that, perhaps, but the, the ears seem to be deaf, and so it's uh, been kicking around for a while, and now Somerville is in this process, and Shu is trying to uh, shed some light um, or develop insight around how you all can react in the face of this um, uh, big development-driven plan. So she invited me to talk about this, and I will try and do it in now a very few minutes. So uh, I, I, we are a partnership. I'm the guy on the left, Stani Ordanova, who was in school uh, and is a friend of Shoes, my partner back there, and Matthew Snyder, uh, the third one. These are people we work with as if we're uh, almost, I mean, we don't do so much work in Boston. We do quite a bit of traveling, but we do an immense amount of work electronically, digitally, via Skype with people in different places. Uh, Matthias Schuler is the founder of Transolar, a great firm with respect to sustainability. They call themselves climate engineers. Um, Michael Van Valkenburg, you will know, but a, a brilliant landscape thinker, but also a great environmentalist, and our structural engineer, Richmond So. But th these are guys we talk to virtually every day, and our and we don't think of the work that we the, the work that they do as separate from our own the energy and the environment and the landscape and the structure and the architecture are all part of the same project um, so <clears throat> this is quite important I'm, I've always been fascinated by the difference between tactics and strategy and often and I was puzzled as a kid was like didn't make sense they're the same right but they're not and this is one of my favorite, but it's kind of impenetrable. Um, the more generic version of strategy and tactics would be something like uh, tactics is uh, knowing how to get the army over the mountain, and strategy is about whether or not it's a good idea. Um, and so we think of ourselves as we are designers, but we do lots of other things, but we try to operate strategically as much as possible. So, and, and I don't know how I how that became an interest, but I, when I was quite a long time ago, I'm, uh, I live here, I've taught at Harvard for a long time, but I'm Canadian, like Turgeon, who pronounces his name the American way. Um, <laughs> he's, a, he's a Quebecer, for sure. They're like 10 hockey players with his name. Um, so I was hired by Phyllis Lambert, who did the Seagram Building in New York, to do the Canadian Center for Architecture, with, uh, extraordinary project, but in a city that, where the city is discussed and debated by lots of people all the time, and we saw this building as, certainly it was this incredible institution, but it was also an urban repair. It was in a location that had been damaged by highway ramps, on ramps, off ramps, etc. I won a competition to do the master plan for the Port of Montreal, which I, as a very young architect, spent three, four hundred million dollars on all government money. Um, 
And the, my, our proposition was to do very little. We said that this, is, this should be public dom domain, not private domain. Um, it's where the Canadian economy uh, first developed ahead of steam because it's the connection between sea lanes to Europe, rail lines to the West Coast. And what I did was make a park out of it, uh, light some of the, the industrial buildings which were no longer in use, and I dug up a canal which activated, it had been filled in when the metro was built. And by reopening it, all the buildings which were sort of in decay and the industrial kind of infrastructure became valuable again and some of the best housing in the city. It's one of the things I'm most proud of. Um, we, with the guys that I showed you, we did a, a competition for Helsinki, uh, low to no, it was for a, a kilometer square, 25,000 people, almost carbon zero, to not enough time to go into, but a very interesting thing. We were one of four teams, we were paid quite a lot of money, we lost quite a lot of money. We do uh, a, a broad range of things. This is a yoga building for Kripalu, uh, radiant heating, radiant cooling, uh, uses very little energy, active facade, very compact. We do houses for people with quite a lot of money. Um, but on interesting sites, and we do them discreetly, I think, and carefully. Um, and we also, the, the clients we've had are, have been quite terrific, and we do a fair amount of experimenting in them, and they're all highly, well, mostly highly sustainable, very, like, transformers, very highly operable. This is a house on the vineyard made of concrete. When the bluff collapses, it can be lifted in six pieces to another foundation with all of the interiors and fixtures and stuff. And this is a project we're doing in Turkey that's completely off the grid, solar, wind, battery backup. Again, with those characters that I showed you. Really hard to work in Turkey. Um, that's a rendering on the top. So, Somerville, brick bottom competition. Um, you know, so brick bottom is somewhere down in here. Somerville is big. And Somerville, if you look at cities, if you study cities, Somerville is located in one of the most prime positions in Boston. It's connected to everything except by any decent transportation system. <laughs> so this is the area that we ended up looking at. And th this was brick bottom, and this was sort of, we looked at that and we thought, what's the point of doing something there? Um, you can do anything there, but if that's all you do, you will do virtually nothing. This is a, trying to think strategically. We also think tactically. So we, we looked at everything around, and there's just this incredibly sharply defined pile of stuff that we, we, I think we call underperforming. It's a polite way of putting it. Um, so we expanded the site, broke the rules, and ended up just saying, a, we don't have enough time. B, we're not even going to enter the competition. Um, so part of what you do when you're trying to figure out how to solve a problem, that you do what a doctor does, basically. Uh, or when you're trying to buy a company, you, you try and understand you know, what happened. How did we get, how did this get this way? How do you have this really kind of well-developed, textured, multifaceted, multi-purpose, mixed-use city, and this stuff in the middle. Well, these rail lines played a big role, and we call them urban fractures. Basically, you put them in, and you, you divide one piece from another, and both start to fail. I mean, it's the same thing with, heart, with arteries in the body. So, and then, to add insult to injury, God knows why anyone thought this was a good idea, um, but another fracture. So, and we were sort of fascinated by this thing. It seemed so easy to fix. There's so much width of railway right of way that we felt you could get rid of this one. So that piece starts to be usable. You drop this below grade, which is not, it's completely doable in the distances and with the elevations. It costs money, but it's small money in, in civic terms. You do the same to this one. You drop this guy on the ground and make a boulevard. And now this 
all of this is navigable by foot, car, whatever you want. It's sort of on one plane and connected. Um, so rebuild it. We, 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 I like the word repair, and there, the latter part of the middle part and latter part of the 20th century was not good to American cities. There's a lot of busted stuff, and maybe repair is not the right word, but it's it's a we'll consider it a placeholder. Um, so I live near Fresh Pond Parkway. McGrath has the, this is just city car counts: 39,000 cars per hour at peak. Fresh Pond Parkway, 39,000, same. McGrath, 150 feet wide, Fresh Pond Parkway, 42. It's not safe, it's not enough, but Mass, Mass Ave is just a little bit less, and it's, I, I, it's 67 feet wide. So elevated, kind of a mess, and wildly too wide. Um, so build landscape over the depressed railway. I mean, you can build buildings, but it's simpler and cheaper to do landscape. Um, and so cities are made of networks of streets that generally have infrastructure embedded in them. And the name of the game is to figure out how to make them uh, intelligently so any number of uses are possible into the future. To give them a small enough grain so you can have lots of buildings and lots of streets and lots of space. And it's, it's really an art form. I mean, Barcelona did it. There was a man named Cerda who did a grid that's just fabulous. And the reason New York is what New York is is that it's a, an incredible plan, the right dimensions, the right infrastructure structure and all that sort of stuff. And it can happen when in a messy, all of the, with all these different grids around, it's tougher, but the name of the game is to stitch it together. So we were just playing with these things. I'm telling my, so fixing Union Square and so, suddenly Somerville and Cambridge are separated, but they should just, they, on occasion they drift one into the other and they nurture each other and so that becomes possible here. Um, this is mostly big box and maybe you keep big box because it's revenue and, and this is, where the auto part, the, the auto stuff, the places with the dogs um, are, and you, ha you keep some of that. So, and you have T lines, I mean, the, the, T, the green line is, I, I, I used to teach the history of mobility as, as part of the sustainability curriculum, and we did quite a bit of study of the Boston public transport system. It's a tram. You climb up in it, you climb down, it goes very slowly. It's got the capacity of, I mean, it's, it's very low capacity, very slow, but it's reliable, should be. So we, we just suggested you put a lot of, put lots of stops, three stops, I guess they're going to be two, but for something like that, it's pretty easy. And then, again, generic building types. I mean, in New York, the buildings are generic. They, they go from house to skyscraper, but they're in increments you can add and, and, and subtract. So we're just laying these things out quite thoughtfully with quite a bit of sort of intelligence and knowledge, but there's nothing fancy. It's big box. And then this is what it was before. That's the network with a li funny little McGrath showing. Um, and this is what you get. You sort of superimpose these and you realize that there just, there just isn't enough way, there aren't enough ways of getting around now and if you take a kind of generic density of, of roads and streets, there's an awful lot of stuff that happens. This is quite disconnected, 16 points of connection from the interior to outside. You change the grid and you get 36, sort of 200 odd percent more. And then use. I, we are mixed use, as by definition. Cities are mixed use. And zoning is one of those things that's kind of tricky. Um, but Maybe you zone this as industrial and this as big box and the rest of this can be whatever. That's the little park play, park spot. And you, you, there's tons of space here. So we just 
you know, that's what is in this area now, and we were just projecting sort of average three, four stories high, uh, million square feet, million three of footprint for residential, and we just keep going. And, whoops, sorry. Um, and this FAR, two, two, and a, two, two and a half million square feet of housing, lots of retail, and so on, and a little bit less industrial, maybe. And so, ba basically, I guess that's Washington Street, I think, and this is sort of Union Square. And you can take, th these are generic block sizes. On the main streets, you put bigger buildings. On the side streets, you have alleys, and always you have light in between the buildings. They should be thin section buildings, generally, because that's the way the world is going. That's what light and air and ideas about sustainability and more comfortable space for people. That's where that's going. This is another look. We did my, I mean, nobody paid us for this. Sort of a silly way to run a practice. <laughs> um, I, the, the greatest compliment I've ever been paid was by the elderly boyfriend of a woman I've done a couple of projects for who, uh, he was 90, he was, uh, uh, he was Jewish um, from Russia, and he was tiny, and I, we did, did this very beautiful house in Vermont for this woman who's an art collector. And he came up to me and he said, Mr. Rose, I know nothing about architecture. I'm a tailor. But about this building, what I like a lot, it's the stitching. This is stitching. That's what thinking about that. And, and there's a lot of tricky stitching here. And if you are heavy handed about it, it, you will lose the grain and the sort of character and a lot of the quality of this place. So that's that. Almost 10 minutes, not quite 10 minutes. <laughs>